if you are interpreting cases on squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck, you have got to understand the importance of human papillomavirus to oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. This lecture is a little fewer pictures and a little more text, but it's a really important topic. Traditionally, the risk factors for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma include tobacco, and that includes uh, cigarettes, cigars, chewing tobacco, and also some other equivalent items, uh, famously in India, betel nut. And then there's also alcohol. But importantly, the combination of tobacco and alcohol is synergistic, and patients who both smoke and drink are at extremely high risk for squamous cell carcinoma of the upper aerodigestive tract. But then in the early 2000s, and I'll, I know the research went on before that, but really clinically in the early 2000s, there was a new type of patient who emerged with oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. These patients did not have the traditional risk factors of tobacco and alcohol. They tended to be younger patients and their risk factor was oral sex. Eventually we figured out that the common element was infection of the upper aerodigestive tract with the human papillomavirus. So what is HPV? It's a DNA virus. That is, it inserts its DNA into the cellular virus and hijacks the cellular protein creation system. It is exclusive to human beings and it's spread in general by sexual contact. There are multiple types of HPV and these are enumerated. There's 30 some of them, I believe. Um, the two that are most important to our discussion because they cause most of the cancers are HPV-16 and HPV-18. From the perspective of oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, we're pretty much exclusively talking about HPV subtype 16. So if we're talking about HPV-16, what is P16? Well, P16 is different. It's a protein that becomes overproduced in cells that are infected by HPV. There is a disruption of some suppressing DNA uh, when the HPV is inserted into the, uh, into the genome, and you end up with overproduction of this protein. That's an oversimplification for sure. It turns out that it's much easier to detect this protein, this P16 protein, than to directly measure HPV. Thus, P16 is used as a proxy for HPV infection. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty close proxy. In fact, some authors believe that it might be a better risk stratifier than HPV itself. So we've really moved away from searching for the HPV itself to searching for just this protein. Now it is possible for HPV to infect cells, but not be the cause of the cancer per se. We know this because patients who have both HPV and the traditional risk factors of smoking and drinking end up with an intermediate risk for recurrence. That is somewhere between those that we know are associated with HPV and those that we know are associated with smoking and drinking. Presumably, some of those patients had cancers caused by their smoking and drinking, and some of them had, and thus the HPV was just a bystander, and some of them had cancers caused by the HPV per se. We like the phrase now HPV associated cancers rather than uh, calling them HPV positive or saying that they're caused by HPV because it sort of takes this bystander effect into account. Uh, admittedly, everyone still says HPV positive. It's hard to, it, it's hard to change those habits. So is HPV-associated cancer a different cancer than traditional squamous cell carcinoma? Yes, yes, yes. It's a totally different disease. It happens to look the same histopathologically, but it is a different disease, and we need to think of it that way. HPV-associated cancers are much more treatable, so much more treatable that we're talking about de-escalation of the toxic therapies, that is, treating patients less if they are HPV positive because they are so much less likely to recur and they're so much less likely, so much more likely to be cured. In fact, there's a whole different staging system as of AJCC8, a whole different staging system for HPV-associated cancers. Now, unfortunately, HPV cancers result in some unusual metastasis. Their nodes are more likely to be cystic lymph nodes. Hematogenous mets are more likely in weird, unusual locations. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of the existing literature was created before we were carefully treating these as two different diseases, and it ends up being a combination of traditional squamous cell carcinoma and HPV-associated carcinoma, and, and this is a problem, figuring out which of our conclusions are dependent on which of these diseases. I should note that you will occasionally hear about HPV-positive cancers outside the oropharynx. What happens if you have an HPV-positive nasopharyngeal cancer? What happens if you have an HPV-positive larynx cancer? And the answer is we don't really have an answer for that yet. And so we do not take HPV into consideration in the staging of tumors other than oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So to show some examples of these unusual manifestations of HPV, uh, these purely cystic metastases are a hallmark of HPV-associated or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so if you see a cystic metastasis, look particularly hard at the oropharynx to see if you can find the primary tumor. Uh, you'll notice that this is a pretty good mimic for a branchial cleft cyst, but we know that when adults present with seeming uh, branchial cleft cyst, it's more likely to be a cystic metastasis from squamous cell carcinoma. Don't be fooled. This cystic metastasis is such a, a strong association with HPV that if you see solid nodes from a tumor that is nominally positive for HPV, that patient is still at a higher risk of treatment failure, and perhaps that HPV is actually a bystander in those situations. So solid nodes are a risk factor relative to um, uh, cystic nodes, even within this category of HPV-associated cancers. Here's an example of odd spread of disease that we see uh, just with the HPV-associated cancers. Th this sort of metastatic spread is much less common in traditional HPV-negative or a pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. This patient has a retrocural metastasis of squamous cell carcinoma, and I will tell you that there is no evidence of thoracic disease in this patient. This didn't just spread down through the mediastinum. This, is, this patient had level two and level three nodes and this node as the only manifestations of disease outside the primary. Here's another weird area of nodal spread. Uh, this, this enlarged lymph node, which was confirmed to be squamous cell carcinoma, there was no other disease below the level of the clavicle except for this node. That's a weird pattern. Sometimes, HPV-associated or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas will have different timing patterns. Um, this, is a, this is a metastatic node, a recurrent metastatic node after the patient was clinically negative for disease and radiologically negative for a long time. In fact, this scan was taken 38 months after the conclusion of therapy, more than three years. We know that for squamous cell carcinoma, 95% of recurrences, at least in the PET-CT era, 95% of recurrences will be detected in the first two years. The idea of a recurrence after three years out is really a curveball. I wouldn't even advocate for screening patients radiologically at this, at this time frame, but um, HPV-associated disease does weird things. Another weird way that HPV-associated or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma can spread is distant hematogenous metastases to bone. And this is an example of disease in the pelvis, and this is the only manifestation of disease that this patient had um, outside of T1N1 disease in the neck. So there are a variety of ways that HPV-associated oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma differs from traditional oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, that is HPV-negative oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. And these differences are really important to understand for radiologists who are imaging these patients.